Well, this is our last week in this particular sermon series, and I know I keep saying this a lot, but we have different faces in and out. So just by way of reminder, we're doing basically a great big series of sermons. I don't even know how long it's going to be yet, but it's going to take us quite a while to look at God's plan of redemption. That is primarily what the Bible is about, at least from my perspective. You've got about the first two chapters or so in Genesis, a little bit into chapter 3 that, that talk about creation, and then from pretty much that point on, I happen to be reading through a lot of that again, just because it's a new year and I'm in my Bible plan, and, and everything beyond that, and there are different stories and different characters, but it's essentially about how does this holy God that created everything, how can we be with him? How can we dwell with him? And that seems to be primarily what the Bible is about, the sense that human beings can be redeemed and, and spend our lives in his presence. I mean, how, hallelujah. And so it takes a long time to get, to get through all of that, and I'm trying to break this up into more manageable, smaller sermon series. And so the last couple weeks, and this is the last week, is a series called Prophet Land. And I mentioned at the beginning it might be different than some things you've heard, and, and, and some of you have said that is different than some things we've heard, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to look at it. Sometimes we're not too familiar in, in general with the Old Testament and, and maybe particularly with some of these prophecies because you read through them and you think, well, what do, I, what do I do with this? And so I'm going to ask you just to trust me a little bit that it does very much fit into this bigger picture and you'll see that more and more as we go on next week and in the weeks to follow. And the language of these prophets can be a little bit confusing until we learn that they thought and taught in word pictures. These are the Hebrew prophets. They're the Old Covenant Israelite people, all the same people. And essentially, I was just listening to a, to a podcast last night, actually, and I really liked the way this person put it. And I had never thought about it this way, but he said essentially that, that Yahweh sent prophets to be the lawyers to indict judgment on the Israelites. So that helps us get an understanding. We know what, you know, what lawyers do, but that's, that's a good way to put it, they had this, this law that they were given and they continued to break it over and over and over and over and think of the prophets like the lawyers that came to enforce those transgressions against the law. But what we've seen is that as we've looked at many texts, and we'll look at some more today, they sound like you end of the planet, end of all the people on the planet, cataclysmic judgments, but then we saw they were actually local judgments against a certain nation or nations that already took place in history. And that's helpful to know because both of those things can't be true. And so we're going to look at that a little bit more this morning. Some more texts like that because I don't want you to think it's just a verse here and there. It's, it's actually takes up a lot of these scriptures. But before that, I want to look at some of the, I guess we'd call them categories that we've seen in these judgment texts. Because as you read the Bible and study it more on your own, you'll be able to start identifying some of these things yourself. And let me just remind you, ne never believe anything because I said it was true, or any, any pastor or teacher for that matter, but be a good Berean, go back to the Bible on your own to see if what you were taught was true. And so some of the categories that we see are sun, moon, and stars that are used in these passages together. Now clearly, literally, there are sun, moon, and stars, but they're not always used in a literal sense in the Bible. So we're going to go all the way back to, to Genesis 37. These first several verses are right in your notes there. Genesis 37, verse 9 and following, it says, Then he dreamed another dream. This is Joseph, not Mary's Joseph, but Joseph with the fancy coat that made his brothers je jealous, that Joseph. He dreamed a dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I've dreamed another dream. The sun, moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? So Joseph's father and brothers, they knew exactly what was being communicated by his dream. Dad, mom, and his brothers were all going to bow down to him. In Revelation 22, 16, Jesus says, I am the bright and morning star. So there's a case where, where Jesus is comparing himself to a star. Obviously, Jesus wasn't, wasn't literally a star. In the book of Joel, undoubtedly my favorite prophet, the sun and moon are turned to blood. Let's look at these verses. This is Joel 2, 30 and 31. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. 
That passage from Joel is quoted by Peter in Acts chapter 2, wonderful portion of scripture. And of course, there's other similar language about sun, moon, and stars in other places. So again, I'm not saying there aren't literally sun, moon, and stars. I'm saying sometimes the prophets used them figuratively or symbolically in these prophecies. There are some so-called modern prophets. I'm going to name one of them. I generally don't call out people by name, but when they've written books and everything's public and you could look it up anyway, sometimes I'll do that. And especially if I think that they're false teaching, I'll do that. Now this might bother some of you because you might really like this person. I don't know. His name's John Hagee. John Hagee has a church of about 17,000, so he's got us beat there. (laughs) He's 81, and he's at least preaching some. I don't know if he's in full-time ministry, but but he's spent an awful lot of time talking about blood moons and and said there were these four blood moons. This has already taken place, and after the four blood moon, it was going to begin the Battle of Armageddon and so forth. It really hasn't happened how he thinks it will happen, so then he keeps having to revise what he does. But there's an example of someone who's, who's taking these things in a way that I think the prophets did not and therefore is ending up making false prophecies. And we're going to get to some more of these folks a little bit later in the message. Just one example. How about clouds? We see clouds used. Same thing with clouds. Are there real clouds? Of course. Um, did God sometimes seem to manifest clouds in a real way? Yes. But sometimes they're used symbolically. I may not go through all these texts, and you can look at some more of these on your own, but they're, they're in your notes there too. But let's look at several. Exodus 13, 19 and 20 says, The angel of God was going before the host of Israel, and he moved and went behind them. This is kind of fun. I just read about the Israelites crossing the Red Sea the last couple days. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was a cloud and darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. And then verse 24 says, In the morning watch, the Lord and the pillar of fire and cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic. God's glory appears in clouds. Exodus 16.10 says, As soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Moses received the Ten Commandments in a cloud. Exodus 19. 9 says, And Yahweh said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you, that they may believe you forever. And then verse 16 says, On the morning of the third day there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. Let's go to a text in Numbers, Numbers 14, 14, so easy reference to remember. For you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people. For you, O Lord, are seen face to face and your cloud stands over them. And you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So we just see in those instances that that God's presence is sometimes manifest in these clouds. By the way, in Hebrew, sometimes when things are translated in English, seeing God face to face, the idea is really being in the presence of God. Even the, the showbread that was in the temple and then there were certain candles that would light on it and the idea was that that was in the in the presence of God that that bread represented the presence of God which eventually was was Jesus himself who called himself the bread of life but the idea is they were in the presence of God and when the priest went into the temple then there was this 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 cloud and then they would meet with God there face to face it didn't mean that that God was sitting there in a literal body speaking to them but they were in the presence of God that's the idea that was conveyed there this one's kind of interesting. Isaiah 19.1 An oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and comes to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. I highly doubt if we believe there that's saying that God was, and I'm not trying to be irreverent, but that God was somehow literally riding a cumulus cloud or something, landing in Egypt and people's hearts melted. Nahum said the clouds are the dust of God's feet. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Let's move on to earthquakes. Not always called an earthquake, but sometimes the prophets would talk about the the earth being moved out of its place, the heavens shaking, the earth rocking and reeling. Let's look at Haggai 2, 21 and 22. Speak to Zerubbabel, great name, Governor of Judah, saying, I'm about to shake the heavens and the earth and overthrow the throne of kingdoms. 
I'm about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders, and the horses and their riders shall go down, every one by the sword of his brother. So again, we have the shaking of the heavens and earth. Here are a couple more, Isaiah 13, 13. Therefore I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts and the day of his anger. And one more from Micah 1. Verses 3 and 4. Behold, the Lord is coming out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth and the mountains will melt under him and the valleys will split open like wax before the fire, like waters poured down on a steep place. And you're probably already seeing already, I mean, if you haven't studied this a lot on your own, how, how familiar these themes are. There aren't too many themes. We have cosmic disturbances, thunder, lightning, earthquakes, heaven shaking, sun, moon, and stars mountains melting, things like that. And then we have things being attributed to Yahweh that we would think normally are more human characteristics, like he's the one wielding the sword, he marches out, he comes down. There are only a few of these themes and you'll start to see them used over and over and over. Now, does this mean there are not real earthquakes? Of course not. But it does mean that sometimes the earthquaking and shaking is a symbol for nations faltering and fading. There has to be a real thing for the symbol to make sense. Just like us, the Hebrews experienced real earthquakes and when they used this earth-shattering language, they were saying that chaos and governments and nations and battles could feel like the earth was moving around them. You also see this other theme, the Lord coming out of his place, coming down, phrases we've seen several times. Well, let's just look briefly at thunder and lightning. Sometimes they're used independently, sometimes together. We see in Isaiah 29, 6, you will be visited by the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and great noise, with whirlwind and tempest and the flame of a devouring fire. When the trumpet sounds, he says, aha, and he smells the battle from afar, the thunder of the captains and the shouting from Job 39. For Samuel 2, 10, the adversaries of Yahweh shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven and Yahweh will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Here are a couple with, with lightning and some combinations of these things. Bow your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains so they smoke. Flash forth the lightning and scatter them. Send out your arrows and rout them. Um, lightnings are often used as judgment as if the Lord himself was shooting arrows. You'll see that again in, in another text here. The Lord will appear over them and his arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will sound the trumpet and march forth in the whirlwinds of the south. Let's go on to the last passage here from Job. Keep listening to the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. Under the whole heaven he lets go and his lightning to the corners of the earth. So in some of these, thunder and lightning are combined and there are other elements we've seen too. The Lord appearing, the Lord marching forth. And so on. Here's a, a couple things. This is not in your notes, but from Isaiah 19 and 20, I'm just highlighting a couple verses here. In that day, the Egyptians will be like women and tremble with fear before the hand of the Lord of hosts shakes over them. And the Lord will strike Egypt and Assyria will come into Egypt. So shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptian captives. So like these other passages we've looked at, the Lord is actually using Assyria to judge another nation but he is ultimately behind it and uses language like the hand that the Lord shakes and the Lord strikes them. Is it true the Lord was administering the judgments? Absolutely. And did they literally happen to these nations? Absolutely. But was the Lord literally shaking his hands and striking them? Absolutely not. And so it's good to see again how they use this language. Um, we'll look at a couple other texts, but I hope you can see it's not just a verse here and there. All the prophets are doing this, which is very helpful to us. If some of them use this exaggerated metaphoric language and others didn't, then we've got a big problem of interpretation. But they're all doing it just the same. It, it's a continuity, just like you'd expect if the scriptures are actually inspired by God. We're going to go now to a lengthy passage because it just happens to combine all these elements. So look for these different things we've seen this is in your Bible. If you want to follow along, it's on page 703. If you're using one of our Bibles, 703, it's Isaiah 30. So it's on whatever page Isaiah 30 is in your own Bible if you have that. And again, 703 in our Bibles. It's, it's Isaiah 30, 
25 and through 33. Again, it's a little lengthy, but bear with me because I just want you to see all this in one place. Isaiah 30, beginning in verse 25. And again, I mentioned this last week too. I'll, I try to read these texts with the tone that it seems like they have. So I'm not angry, I'm not shouting at anybody, but it's judgment language. On every lofty mountain and every high hill there will be brooks running with water in the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. Moreover, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun and the light of the sun will be sevenfold as the light of seven days in the day when the Lord binds up the brokenness of his people and heals the wounds inflicted by his blow. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar, burning with his anger and in thick rising smoke. His lips are full of fury and his tongue is like a devouring fire. His breath is like an overflowing stream that reaches up to the neck to sift the nations with the sieve of destruction and to place on the jaws of the peoples a bridle that leads astray. Verse 29, you will have a song as in the night when the holy feast is kept and gladness of heart as when one sets out to the sound of the flute to go to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel. And the Lord will cause his majestic voice to be heard and the descending blow of his arm to be seen in furious anger and a flame of devouring fire with a cloud burst and storm and hailstones. The Assyrians will be terror stricken at the voice of the Lord when he strikes with his rod and every stroke of the appointed staff that the Lord lays on them will be to the sound of tambourines and lyres. Battling with brandished arm, he will fight with them. For a burning place has long been prepared indeed for the king and is made ready. Its pyre made deep and wide with fire and wood in abundance. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of sulfur, kindles it. So in this passage, Yahweh, speaking through Isaiah, he pulls out all the stops. We've got a day of great slaughter. We've got heavenly disturbances involving the sun and moon. The name of the Lord is burning with anger and thick smoke, and he will sift the nations. He will place a bridle on the jaws of the people. We also see the Lord's arm descend with a flame of devouring fire, and the Lord burning up everything with his breath, which is like sulfur. It's all there. Heavenly disturbances, Yahweh demonstrating many human behaviors and physical actions, and it sounds like it's the end of everything at least once just in that passage. How do we know it's not? Well, you could look outside, but we could also go on in the text where we're going to find out that Isaiah tells us when this was fulfilled. And that's in Isaiah 37. So it's page 710, just a few pages over. In our Bibles, Isaiah 37, verses 33 to 36. Isaiah 37, 33 to 36. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city or shoot an arrow there or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way he came, by the same he shall return and not come into this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and the sake of my servant David. Now listen carefully to this next verse because this is where it all culminates. And the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. I'm going to read the last verse one more time. That's in the ESV. There's nothing wrong with that translation, but I'm going to read it out of the New King James just because sometimes it, it helps to hear things a bit differently. Verse 36, out of the New King James, Then the angel of the Lord went and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. Now one of the things I'm trying to do, and I hope I'm doing it well at least some of the time, is not only to admonish all of you and encourage you to read and study the Bible, but teach you how to do it. There are a lot of other people that could probably teach you how to do it better, but I'm just trying to give you the different tools that help me. One of those tools is sometimes to read things really, really slowly. The biblical writers could cover a tremendous amount of territory sometimes in two or three verses. And we just read over them and go to the next verses. But let's look at verse 36 slowly. It says 185,000 Assyrians were killed. And then after that it says the rest of the people arose the next morning. 
They slept through the night. No one heard a sound. No one on the watchtowers was alerted. No alarm bells are sounded. Are you kidding me? 185,000 people, which I understand and take literally, were killed and no one noticed a thing until the morning? Now let's not minimize what happened, but let's also say that the language that we read in the previous passage compared to what actually happened is a little bit anticlimactic. I mean, you've got heavenly disturbances, things blowing up all over the place, you know, hearts melting, the Lord doing this and that, and what really happened was all these soldiers, while they were sleeping, were killed and no one else noticed a thing. That's why it's so important to go through these prophecies and to find out what actually took place. And here yet is another example of the Hebrew prophets using very exaggerated language in a way that we do not, at least we don't typically in these contexts, but to convey something. Now, I've mentioned before, sometimes using metaphor, using figurative language actually brings something a little more truthful to that. I mean, that could have been told the angel of the Lord went and killed 185,000 people. That's devastating. But the way it's explained, we, we get a sense of just how horrific, horrific it was. And I think that's why they used that kind of language. Well, let me just talk about me for a minute because I don't, I don't want to assume what all of you think. But, and this is actually a little bit embarrassing to say right now, but um, you know, I read the Bible for years, not just these, these prophetic texts, but a lot of the Bible for years as if God had written it specifically to a person called Joel Rosenauer who used to be a 20th century American and now is a 21st century American. He did it all for me. Um, nope. <laughs> Why it's so important to look at audience relevance questions. Who, what, when, where, how. This was a specific prophecy that happened thousands of years ago. Now we can take applications to it for our own life. But this is where, and again, I'll just speak for me, where, where I got into, not trouble necessarily, but where I really used to misinterpret a lot of the Bible because I completely ignored the original audience. Didn't even think of them. One of the reasons I did that is because I was sort of told not to think about them. I was told, and you've maybe heard these things, the Bible is just a love letter written to me. Well, what if your name's Ananias or Sapphira or you're a Canaanite? And they were all killed. We, we have to have context when we read the Bible. It's living and active? Absolutely. We can apply it to our lives? Absolutely. It's transformative through the scriptures. We can find a relationship with God through Christ? Absolutely. But we're still reading somebody else's mail. These documents were originally written to real people in real places with real history. And after we learn that, that's where we can start interpreting the Bible correctly. Remember, interpretation always comes first. Then the next question is, what does it mean for me? It's a great question. What does it mean for me? But don't make it the first question because it completely ignores the people to whom these documents were actually written and we often misinterpret things. And I did that for, for a long time. Well, let's go now to, back to the book of Micah, chapter 1. We looked at a couple of these verses earlier, but we're going to look at a few more. This is page 923, if you want to use one of our Bibles, 923, Micah 1, and we're going to read verses 2 through 8. Micah 1, 2 through 8. Again, I'm just comparing Scripture with Scripture so we can actually see how prevalent this, this language is. Micah 1, beginning in verse 2. Hear you peoples, all of you, pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it. And let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth, and the mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will split open like wax before the fire, like water is poured down a steep place. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Jacob, is it not Samaria? And what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap in the open country, a place for planting vineyards, and I will pour down her stones into the valley and uncover her foundations. All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces. All her wages shall be burned with fire and all her idols I will lay waste for from the fee of a prostitute she gathered them, and the fee of a prostitute they shall return. For this I will lament and wail. I will go stripped and naked. I will make lamentation like the jackals, and mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, like the ostriches. 
Again, the Bible's not G-rated, at least not a lot of it. What elements do we see in this prophecy? Hero, peoples, pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it. Sounds like it's going to affect everybody, no question. The Lord is coming. The Lord will come down. The mountains will melt under him. The valleys will be split open. We've seen all this other places. Sounds like an end of the planet, end of all people, cosmic disaster that will affect the entire world, everyone and everything. Now look at verse 1. Same chapter, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Morasheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning who? Samaria and Jerusalem. That's who the judgment was actually about. By the way, um, this isn't in my notes, but it just came to mind. That's why it's so helpful, at least it has been to me, to understand a little bit of what I've been um, teaching about Old Covenant Israel because we realize an awful lot of these judgments were either... You know, when the, when the kingdom split, after the first three kings of Israel, remember we have um, King Saul, King David, and Solomon. There's only one kingdom of Israel. It's united. After Solomon, it splits. Israel is the northern kingdom. Ten of the twelve tribes are there. Judah is the southern kingdom. Two of the twelve tribes are there. And so many of these judgments are actually about Assyria. It happened about 722 B.C. Or about Judah, which happened about 586 B.C., or 70 A.D., a lot of them are pointing to that, the ultimate destruction of Israel. If we don't know that, that's one of the reasons, I think, why a lot of these prophecies have been taken, like all this, all this end of the world stuff. But they were actually about, about those things. And that, that is not a small deal in Scripture. Basically, the, the entire Old Testament, and, and, and the next few weeks we're going to see even a lot of the new, is pointing to that one destruction of Jerusalem. And, and so... Boy, we miss that, and um, it, it's really hard to interpret a lot of the Bible, I, I think, at least I found. And so here's another case there. Micah is prophesying about the coming destruction of the ten northern tribes of Assyria and then the, the siege later on Jerusalem. Again, why we've got to think of that original, original audience. This particular passage, incidentally, from Micah, I think, I think what happened, just because you know, my kids have biblical names, and I was, and I was reading this passage, I don't know when it, when it was, not three, four years ago, five years ago maybe, and I was reading that, and I had had, I had had a hard time interpreting a lot of the stuff the prophet said, to be honest, and I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking, this seems like this cataclysmic world-ending thing, but I had read other prophecies a few days earlier that sounded like the same thing. I'm like, wait a minute, how many times does this get destroyed? You know, how many people are destroyed? And then do these new people just appear out of nowhere and they're destroyed? I mean, how many times can you destroy everything? And I think because it was Micah, and my son's name's Micah, and so it, I'm just thinking, I'm like, wait a minute. And that was one of the things that really got me looking into all these other prophecies, and it was really, it's so exciting, and it doesn't, there's a lot I don't understand still, but but it's just thrilling to go, oh, I, I get it. They're, they're using this kind of language. They're all doing the same thing. Another thing that I finally began to understand that we've talked about is that salvation and judgment in the prophets are two sides of the same coin, where sometimes with just in a few verses, they'll say some things and it sounds like this harsh judgment, and then they're talking about salvation. Like, which is it? They're talking about the same judgment. A lot of times the judgment on Jerusalem, for example, the people that refused Jesus were destroyed in that. The people that embraced Jesus were told to flee and get out. And we'll talk about that. It's pretty thrilling. So judgment and salvation, the prophets often kind of intermingled it. And now I get that. Now I understand this exaggerated language and it really brings a lot of the Bible to life. And it's, it's great stuff. Well, let, let's go on to Isaiah 64. Let's look at a couple more things here. Isaiah 64, this is back in your notes, I believe. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down, that the mountains might shake at your presence as when the melting fire burns. The fire causes the waters to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. When you did terrible things, which we looked not for, you came down and the mountains shook at your presence. There again, God is described as coming down, among other ideas that are starting to be familiar by now. And in all these passages we've looked at, without exception, they speak, when they speak rather, of God coming down, coming out of heaven, riding a cloud, marching out, having a sword. Never once were those things literally taking place, but, but God was behind the scenes as if God was directly doing it, but he was actually working through one nation against another nation. 
Isaiah, David, and others help us to understand that. Well, let's take a look at um, one more passage here that has some of the same language, but it also ties in a lot of some of the previous sermons. Amos 8, 8 and 9. I wanted to say famous, famous Amos. Famous Amos 8, 8 and 9. Shall not the land tremble on this account and everyone mourn who dwells in it and all of it rise like the Nile and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt? And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. This also is speaking of a prophecy that was fulfilled in 722 with the judgment of the ten northern tribes of Israel. Um, some Bible people, I'll just make a junk drawer called Bible people, commentators, preachers, people who do videos or whatever. Some believe it was also um, looking to the future fulfillment in AD 70 with Judah and Jerusalem and so on. We've talked about that a little bit. Regardless, it's, it's using this, this same kind of uh, metaphorical, exaggerated language that we've seen in these other texts. I don't think it needs to be explained that the land did not literally tremble or rise and subside like the Nile River. The Lord did not physically take the sun out of its place in the sky at noon and hide it somewhere. Now, I lived in Seattle for quite a few years, and I think he did that with the sun in Seattle. <laughs> but he doesn't do it in southern Idaho too often, thankfully. We get a lot of sun here. Verse 2 of the same chapter says, And he said, Amos, what do you see? I said, A basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, The end has come upon my people Israel. I'll never pass by them again. And now we know where that judgment is was focused. God states in emphatic language how it was the end of the Israelite people, the old covenant Israelites. The people themselves did not completely disappear, but their relationship and marriage covenant to Yahweh did. And we've talked about that some, and we'll talk about that a little more in the future. This was predicted, remember, way, way back in Deuteronomy 32, and we've looked at that quite a bit. But one of those verses says, I will dash them to pieces. I'll make the memory of them to cease from among men. They would no longer have access to to the presence of Yahweh, that covenant would be, would be broken. I want to give you a little bit of good news just to keep things in, in context. Even though that was to happen and all these judgments were to happen, through Christ, the new covenant would have universal ramifications for everyone who would place their faith in Jesus. That would have been the sincere Israelites. There, there were some Israelites, some Jews who did believe, and the Gentiles coming in and they could place their faith in Christ no dividing line anymore between Jew and Gentile. And that's really good news, and we'll be getting into more of that as well. But I think it's remarkable how everything we've looked at really ties together. Again, as if the Bible was actually breathed out by God. Let me encourage you, on your, on your own, go back and look up some of those texts as you have, as you have an opportunity. And I'm going to change gears just a little bit as we begin making our way out of prophet land. We've still got a little, a little time left, but there's something really important here that I want to make sure we hear. There's another element that's really important to see before we leave prophet land. It has to do with the accuracy of these prophets. Did the things they said would happen actually happen? Did the things they said would happen actually happen to the nation they said they would happen to? If there was some sort of timing element on it, sometimes there is, sometimes not, but if there was some type of timing element on it, did the judgment happen to the people it was supposed to happen to at the time it was supposed to happen? And is that a big deal? Well, let's, let's let the Bible answer. This is your last text in your notes if you want to follow along. Very important, at least I think it is. Deuteronomy 18, verses 20 to 22. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. Well, that's pretty clear, isn't it? And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word of the Lord has not been spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. Well, that, that makes sense, doesn't it? The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him, or you could also translate that. You don't, you don't need to worry about that prophet. Don't pay any attention to them. They're not, they're not speaking for God. 
Now, I don't know how much of some of you, how many of you rather, follow some of the modern so-called prophets. I do that a little bit. I think it's important to do as a, as a pastor to try to follow some of this. But, but ever since I got saved in 1993, I just had this little picture, you know, when you're online and you're applying for something, if you're like a little older, and that scroll wheel keeps going, and 1993 just seemed a long ways away when I did that. But I've always, I've always kind of been interested in this stuff in prophecy. Now, granted, not all prophecy is dealing with future events. There's some prophecy, in the, and we see this in the Old Testament, um, where the prophets were speaking directly to them right now, like, like, shape up, you're disobeying God, don't do that. And then some were predicting future events. We have those things today, too. We have people um, that will talk about, sometimes we call it you know, the prosperity gospel or health and wealth. You find Jesus and everything is going to go great. You're going to have plenty of money. You're going to get your new house. You're never going to get sick. If you do get sick, boy, you just don't have enough faith. That's a, a type of prophet. It's a false type of prophesying. But we have people like that. And you may know some people, I know some people personally that have been really, really damaged by that message because they know somebody that got cancer that didn't get healed. Or they've got, you know, they were expecting the promotion and they got canned or something like that. Um, so we need to watch out for those people too. Now, do I think that God wants the best for his children and that sometimes he gives us many of our wants as well as our needs? He seems to do that. But that's a false type of teaching and that happened in the Old Testament too. And, and we looked at a text, I think it was last week, yeah, where basically you know, God was saying, you know, don't, don't listen to them. I haven't told them to say that. They're going around saying, don't worry about whether you obey him or not. You're just fine. We have those kind of prophets today. Um, another kind of prophecy, I guess, is somebody who's always looking for the miraculous. Now, I believe in miracles. And I've had some incredible times in the presence of God and some really wonderful experiences with God. But that's not the gospel. And you've got some people today that are, that are more interested in having the latest, greatest experience with God than they are in Jesus dying on the cross for their sins and being forgiven. We need to watch out for those people. Some of those people will say, if you, if you don't have this spiritual gift or that, you're kind of like a second-tier Christian. But boy, if you're really, if you're really faithful, you know, then you're going to get this, this other gift up here. Don't pay any attention to that. But we do have some people, like a lot of these prophecies we've looked at, that are predicting these future events. And I want to just talk about it for a few minutes anyway because I think it's a big deal. I mentioned one, um, John Hagee. Now, I always, the best I can, I always go to the source. If somebody tells me John Hagee said this, I'm going to go read John Hagee's book. I'm going to find an article by John Hagee or, or hear an interview with him. It drives me nuts when people say things about different pastors or leaders or whatever and they've never gone to the source. And, and sometimes you'll find out people are wrong. Somebody tells them, oh yeah, this person said this and they just believe it. Don't do that. Go, go to the source. Have, have integrity. Otherwise, we can end up involved in slander and gossip without even meaning to. But John Hagee is 81 and without quite, quite setting a date specifically, he said the rapture and or the end of the world is going to happen before he's dead. Eh. He's 81. Shouldn't say things like that. Hal Lindsey, might, some of you might know Hal Lindsey, read a book, Late Great Planet Earth in 1970. Um, I probably read that in 1994-95. I, I bought all of it, hook, line, and sinker. And he said all this was going to happen in 1988. Oops. I sure hope the rapture didn't happen in 1988. <laughs> but, he, but he said that. Um, you might know Harold Camping. Harold Camping had made a bunch of predictions. He's one of the only guys, at least he apologized. Most of them don't. And this is just my opinion, but, but there's a whole cottage industry that's brought in lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of money to some of these folks. If they make a false prophecy, if they have integrity, should they not take all their books and products off the shelves? Wouldn't that be what you'd do if you had integrity? Not a one of them does. Jack Van Impey, he's gone now. Used to watch him on TBN. Now, Jack Van Impey, I mean, and give credit where credit is due. This guy had huge chunks of the Bible memorized. Absolutely amazing. But he did what I used to call newspaper eschatology. Now I call it internet eschatology. He said, newspaper in one hand. This has happened in the Middle East here. This is what the Bible says here. He was wrong on everything. Here's another tip. I'm going to give you a little picture here. Let's, because I don't have a hard... Uh, this is a hymnal 
this is a hymnal, but I'm going to say it's a Bible for now because I don't have a hard copy of Bible. When you're a Christian and you're interpreting things, have the Bible here and the world here and not the world here and the Bible here. In other words, don't interpret the Scriptures through the world and what you see around you. Interpret what you see around you through what the Scriptures say and teach. That's another area where we can get ourselves into big trouble. Edgar Wisenant. Edgar Wisenant was a NASA guy, not a dummy. He wrote a book in 1988 called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Take Place in 1988. It sold a few million copies. There's a reason that, that 88 was a big year, and I, I, I'm tempted to get into it now, um, but I'm not, I'm not going to just for time, and we'll get to some more of it later. Didn't happen. So here's what he did. He realized in his calculations that he had started with the year zero, but he should have started with the year one. And if he had started with the year one, then it would take place in 1989, and he wrote another book called 89 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Take Place in 1989. Um, And we could go through several others. Now, I mean this sincerely. I mean this very sincerely. For their sakes, I'm glad we're no longer under the old covenant law because they would all be dead because they're all false prophets. And here's something interesting. When they write their second book or third book or put out their latest DVD series or their latest movie, why do people buy those? But they do. Why would you do that? Someone's made false prophecies and God's so serious about it that under the old covenant they would have been killed for that, but now they're going to fudge the numbers and rework it and put out the next product and people still buy it. This stuff is a big deal again because, because it, and, and all Christians, I believe, are, we're responsible for our own faith and we're responsible for whether, just to put it bluntly, you know, whether we're gullible or whether we're suckers for a lot of this stuff or not. That's on us. But yet we want to trust these people. Some of them are pastors or they're authors or maybe they've got doctor in front of their name and they should know. And so you've got a lot of believers that are almost focusing more on that stuff than a vibrant, ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ and, and helping their neighbors and being salt and light in the world. Because what happens, and I stole this phrase, is that some believers are more interested in getting on the next flight than they are staying in the fight. For our culture, it's, it's our fault primarily that our culture is where it is, in my opinion. Other people that are driving it are acting in ways that we would expect them to. They don't have a savior named Jesus, they don't have concrete truth, so we're just seeing things lived out in front of us that you would naturally expect to happen by people who are pagans. And so many Christians are thinking, this is so horrible, I can't wait just to get out of here. You find me that message anywhere in the 17 or 1800 pages of your Bible, depending on your translation, how big the font is, anywhere that it says believers are supposed to be the ones going on the defensive, hiding, waiting to get out of this big, terrible, bad world. You're not going to find it anywhere. Salt light ambassadors not be offensive but go on offense we've got the right world view we've got the truth why would we want to hide it and and some of these folks that are writing this stuff i think it's played right into that i'm not saying everybody i'm not even saying most christians but a lot i've been in enough churches and known enough people there's a lot this place is so horrible i i can't i can't wait i mean i i hope two days i'm just out of this big bad terrible place what about your neighbor your family member that doesn't know jesus Uh, What about sex trafficking that's happening over here, these horrible things that are happening to children in the world? What about these? You're the one who can actually do something about that. What about voting or maybe even getting involved somewhere where you could make a difference? Now, I I don't want any conflict. I just want to get out of here. I'm glad the apostles didn't think that way. (laughs) I'm not saying we should go beat up, get beat up all the time and become martyrs, but but we should really be willing to do whatever the Lord asks us to do. Only the real prophets were the ones whose predictions came to pass when and as they said they would. Anyone else then, anyone else now is a charlatan, a con artist, a false prophet, and Yahweh takes that really, really seriously. Spend a couple more minutes on that than I planned on. We're going to wrap this up. I hope you've enjoyed your stay in prophet land, and I know at least some of you it's, it's a been a different way to look at some of these things and that can be a good thing as long as you go back to scripture i made a bold claim in week one that if we applied some of these principles 
you'd be given a new key on your Bible key ring that'll help you to unlock some other texts in the scripture that might not have been as accessible before. And as we go on over the next few weeks, I'm hoping that'll be the case. Now I want to just end here with something I've been thinking about a little bit. And I always try to separate, you know, I don't have a, I don't have a verse for this, but something I've been thinking about as I've been working on this just to to tie this up, that might be helpful for us. Even though we're far removed from prophet land and far removed from a lot of the biblical texts for that matter, from all of them, and even though their worldview and way of communicating is very different from ours in many ways, and we've seen that, maybe in other ways it's not all that different. Have you ever spoken with people who have endured great tragedy or have you ever followed you know, natural disasters on, on the news, newspaper, online, however you get your news? Have you ever personally experienced great pain and sorrow? If you're over like three years old, I know you have. <laughs> have you ever been around someone who lost a dear loved one and heard them say, the day they died, my world ended? Have you ever felt like it was lights out for you in really difficult circumstances? Have you experienced such tragedy you thought there was no hope for tomorrow? Have you believed your whole world was in turmoil and thought my life is in so much chaos the very ground beneath me is shaking? I have a friend from high school who just went through some major medical issues. He's my age. Unfortunately, he seems to be doing really well. But his wife was talking about it on Facebook, giving people updates. And do you know what one of them said? I just don't know if we could bear to lose Scott. He's our whole world. Anybody remember 9-11? 9-1-1? Of course you do. If you lived here at that time, that catastrophe took place thousands of miles away. But did you feel it? Did it shake you a little bit? Did you cry? Were you scared? Did you sense something had died in the world? And for those in New York, do you think maybe they felt like the heavens were trembling, shaking and reeling? Was it earth shattering in some ways? So yes, many things are very different in terms of how we think and speak today. And we always need to keep the original audience in mind. I say that all the time. But I think we can also see in some ways we're just like them. And we also use language the same way in in some instances. And perhaps knowing this will help us as we move on in this long series of sermons emphasizing God's plan of redemption. He has made a way for our sins to be forgiven. He has made a way for us to be in his presence. He has made a way for us to be with him in his world. And, And some of you, I know, are going through tremendously difficult things and others I might not know. But I just am reminding us of something we all know. If, if we can do our best, even in those circumstances, especially in those circumstances, you know, where it feels like the earth's shaking and the heavens are shaking and everything's falling apart, we can have this firm foundation, this anchor, and see Christ as our rock, which he's called a rock several times in Scripture, and be immovable, even in those really, really, really difficult circumstances. doesn't mean they're easy. But we can do that with Jesus and we don't have to just you know, be blown away by every storm that comes along. I'm so thankful for that. What is this way of redemption? Or rather, who is this way of redemption? Jesus. I am the way to the truth and the life. This verse gets quoted sometimes. No one gets to heaven but by means of me. It doesn't say that. Now clearly, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's real and sincere, You get heaven too, but it says no one can be in a relationship with the Father except through me. What does it mean to be in a relationship with him? To be in his presence. And through Christ, we have the presence of this good, gracious, loving Father who forgives our sins like we've sung about earlier. And so no matter what's going on or what kind of shaking and quaking you have in your life with Christ, with a sincere relationship like that, you're going to be, okay, I hope you know this Jesus Hope you've repented of your sins, placed your faith in him and him alone. And I'm talking to some of you that are watching online now. We have a few folks that are usually doing that either live or later. It's the only way to be in relationship with God, the only way to be in his presence now and forever. And if there's anybody that happens to be 
sitting here and you need to more, know more about that, talk to me, talk to one of our elders, talk to somebody around you who's got a relationship with Christ um, so that we can help you, help you with that. So again, I hope these sermons have been helpful in some way and I asked you earlier just to, to trust that they, they will tie in in the next few weeks and I think they will. Um, let me just quickly kind of tell you where we're headed and we'll take communion together. Next week, again, as part of this huge overarching series, we're starting a series called The Old Covenant Israelites in the New Testament. And I just want to show you this really quick because it's, and I might even get a, I might even do a visual next week. I don't do that very often. But I want you just to imagine something just for a moment, then we'll go to communion. Okay, this is Genesis over here. Malachi. Malachi is the last book in our Old Testament. Uh, Matthew here, first book in the New Testament over here. And uh, what I think we've done, there's about 400 years, this pulpit represents about 400 years where God wasn't speaking to Israel at all. No prophets, they're not getting any message from him at all, so it's called the intertestamental period. I think I said that right. Um, 400 years. Because of this gap, sometimes we've taken this line and gone like this. Bam! And we split up what's over here and what's over here. It's one of the biggest tragedies in biblical interpretation, in my opinion. When we get next week and we start seeing John the Baptist, we start seeing Jesus, we start seeing the apostles, do you know who they're talking to? These very same people, the old covenant Israelites, they're the people in the New Testament. Same people, now later a lot of Gentiles come in, but all this ministry is right here. When we start to see this and we get rid of this, sorry, this stupid line that never should have been put there, makes all the difference in the world in terms of how we see scriptures. All right, let's go ahead and, and, uh, and pray together. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for everyone's attention here, these wonderful brothers and sisters. Um, I'm just throwing a lot a lot out there from your word, but thank you for them. Thank you for our wonderful children and the people that are ministering to them right now, and we already prayed for some, some families we have that, that are sick and have a lot of needs. We pray you'll be with them too. Lord, we pray for a fantastic turnout next Sunday afternoon at our potato bar and that lots and lots of money can be raised for this very worthy cause so that Michael Barrett can keep teaching uh, these high schoolers um, about you, and he does such a great job. So we, we pray you'll bring many for that. Help us get home safely, Lord. Also pray with uh, all the playoffs and everything going on that, that people are being wise um, with that and watching those games and, and having fun but not, uh, not being silly and getting, getting into lots of trouble. Uh, Lord, as we go to a time of communion, we thank you once again that through Christ we are your sons and daughters. We are brothers and sisters of one another, and we get to to be a part of this wonderful new covenant that Jesus brought and taught. We pray it in his name. Amen.